So how does authenticity work? I mean, what, what's the idea? And I think one, one way to help understand the idea of authenticity in the manufacturing of, of design objects is to think of a triangle. There's the consumer, there's the manufacturer, and the designer. And all three of them are essential. Without a consumer, then we don't, you know, without, without you, we don't need to be here. It's like nobody wants the product, then no problem. Without the manufacturer, well, that's interesting. You don't, then you have a handcrafted object, which is a beautiful thing, but again, not what people like Charles and Ray were trying to do. But if you just have the manufacturer and the consumer, then no matter what, you don't have somebody who's actually advocating for the design, who's sort of outside the, the direct equation of the manufacturing, to whom the manufacturer is accountable for, in terms of the authenticity. And so all three of them play their role in order to, to lead to authentic product, and most important, to lead to designs continuing to be in the form that they were intended to be, as long as people want them. When it comes to authenticity, I think a lot of people have kind of a fine art idea of authenticity. You know, when you go to a museum and you're, you know, you're there with the, the Mona Lisa or whatever, one of the things that's really amazing about that is that there's only one Mona Lisa. So if, when you make it to the Louvre and you see it, you've, you've seen the, the one and only, which is kind of an amazing idea. That It's a connection for you across the centuries with Leonardo himself. With design, there's not that one original in that same way. Just as when, you know, you speak of a Jane Austen book, you know, there's not one copy of that book that's like the best copy and everything else is sort of, you know, a little bit crummier. She was trying to write a book that would be published in such a way that everybody could read it. It's not an illuminated manuscript. The, the big idea is the words within those, with, within those pages. And that's how it is with, with designs. Mass production is implicit in it. Designers are trying not to design one specific object, especially designers like Charles and Ray who are trying to design for mass production. They were trying to create not just one beautiful object, but a system to create that beautiful object again and again. As, as Ray said, they wanted to, to design things where the act of mass production would make the design better. Think about that. Most of us think about mass production as making things worse. I mean, most of us would say that if we could cook dinner for two, that that would be a better dinner than we could cook for 100 people. But Charles and Ray turned that idea on his head. They said, you know, what are the things that mass production is good at? And what sort of reliability comes from that? What sort of, you know, value? What sort of ability for the chair to last an extremely long time? So again, they were trying to design a system rather than one specific object. The chair they were designing is the authentic chair made by Herman Miller or Vitra tomorrow. That's the chair they were designing. The prototypes that they made are beautiful. The, you know, the early productions are fantastic. They are totally worth it to collect and value. But that was looking back as far as Charles and Ray were concerned. They were always trying to improve their designs. The very first lounge chairs, for example, they were made of glove leather. When Charles and Ray saw the glove leather was not rugged enough for what the lounge chair was going to experience, they realized that you know, well, we got to change that. They didn't say, oh, we failed, or feel that it was a compromise, or they didn't say to Herman Miller and Vitra, we're artists, I'm sorry, you're stuck with our original choice. They said, how can we make it better? In fact, when we work with Herman Miller and Vitra with the molds, the chair that we c compare it to is a chair from, from the mid-60s, after the design was fully matured. The, the, design, the chairs changed all the time after they went into production. There's a chair that has a beautiful X space, the, the Eames um, plastic arm shell. It's a beautiful chair, it was a total home run. It sold many, many chairs, but Charles and Ray knew how they could make it better because they could see how an X-based chair was extremely vulnerable to, to the worker not doing a good job welding it, or even if they did weld it perfectly under certain conditions, it could get so much torque that it would, that it would snap. So what they did is they, made, they invented the H-base. There's no question in Charles and Ray's mind that the H-base was a better base than the, than the X-base. They're always trying to improve it. So I got an example here, and this is a knockoff of the chair I'm sitting in. And I think, you know, if you were looking across the showroom and you saw this chair, you would think, I guess it's some kind of Eames chair. But what's interesting is when you um, go into the details, and Charles used to say the details are not the details, the details make the product. And it's definitely true when you look at this. So here's the knockoff, and here's the original. 
probably sense this a little better, but now let's look at them side by side. You can really see the differences. Look at those details. Look at the screws that are holding in the, the arm on the knockoff on the left. Well, you don't even see them on the right because it's been designed so well that it kind of deftly comes in from behind. Then you notice, of course, that the arm on the on the knockoff is actually only half there because they're trying to save money on metal. Whereas you see this whole elegant swoop on the right that makes up this beautiful arm. The line of the seat itself on the left is very awkward, and whereas you look at the right, not only is it beautiful, but it implies a certain kind of strength that's really there. And, it, and these details go everywhere, like even to the taper of the arm. There's a lovely taper to this that you can see. And you can see that you know the arm starts wider here, tapers down there. And there they've just made you know one, one big thick thing. This is a lovely detail. You have the screw in here holding the material in place. You can see it when you ever see it constructed. It holds the material in place and actually provides tension for it. It, it. On this chair, they've sort of kept the detail of the screw, but is so dishonest about it, uh, all the work is being done elsewhere, and so this is there almost ornamental. Is that you see this where the, where the leather wraps around, that's where the, where the tension is coming that you're sitting on. What's interesting about that is that you could only have designed this chair if you knew exactly how it was gonna be made. You know, when Charles and Ray designed this, they knew that if this chair was successful, 20 years later, there'd be a person in the factory turning it inside out and creating that tension. And you can see that the stretcher goes into the groove here and separates it. And it keeps that tension, which is what you sit in. You has a certain amount of give, which is fantastic. All this is in that original sketch that Charles literally did on the back of an envelope. What's comical about this knockoff chair is that this, they have the spacer. They know the design has a spacer, but what they did is they just attached it to the, to the back of the chair. I mean, it's almost like a design joke. But it serves the one function of tricking somebody who knows that aluminum group chairs have handles into thinking that they're getting an aluminum, aluminum group chair. So the design problem being solved is how to get money out of your pocket. Well, there are a lot of code words. One of the code words is replica. Another is, another is to the designer's specifications or reproductions or the originals are only in museums. All these things always sound kind of plausible, but they're not actually true. And, and that's, how they, that's how they trick you. For the authorized manufacturer, the way you make it, it is what it looks like because it is what it looks like. In other words, it's really the case. Whereas the knockoff company is trying to basically design it from the outside in to give you the illusion that it is something. You know, a chair is a three-dimensional visceral experience, and that's what our partners in, our, in Vitra and Herman Miller uh, understand. So how does the Eames office piece of it work? And the Eames office is a, is a family business. It was founded uh, by our grandparents, uh, Charles and Ray Eames, uh, um, you know, many decades ago. And Charles and Ray spent a lot of time talking to our mother, Lucia, Charles's daughter, about these issues and, you know, and, and how to deal with this idea that design was not supposed to end in the lifetime of the designer, but to be there as long as there was a need for the furniture or the objects that they, that they designed. And people sometimes say, well, we don't know what Charles and Ray would have done. We actually do know what Charles and Ray would have done. They asked it to, the family to make these choices. That's what they would have done. It's what they did do. For example, um, there's issues of materials. There are, some of the materials they worked with are not so environmentally friendly. So they were aware of that and they were experimenting. We have found a treasure trove of these molds that they were experimenting with different kinds of plastic so that they wouldn't have to be reinforced with fiberglass anymore. And lo and behold, today we're proud to make the Eames plastic chair in a much more environmentally friendly way and, and still preserve the, the beauty of the design. And these are challenges that they knew would come up and the best way to deal with them was to make sure that we were informed and empowered to make these decisions because they felt in the end, only the Eames family could determine what is an Eames chair. But the thing is, we don't make these chairs ourselves. We don't handcraft them because that wasn't the point. It was all about systems, about creating ways to give people these experiences again and again. And for that, we have amazing partners like Herman Miller and Vitra, who we've been working with for over half a century. And yet never with this feeling that it was about looking to the past, but about making sure that these chairs continue to solve the needs of the present. And that's really the beautiful thing about this. These are not vintage chairs. These are contemporary chairs. And that's why this authenticity piece is so critical.